COVID just made things weird. This is America Dissected. I'm your host, Dr. Abdul Al Sayed. Make sure to like this video and hit subscribe now for more content and to support the show. Friends, I missed you last week. It's good to be back. And before I get to the meat of today's episode about the ways that the pandemic has changed the very fabric of American life, I've got to speak plainly to the elephant in the room. We're still reeling from a presidential debate of epic proportions, and it was one of the most disappointing displays of public leadership I've ever seen. We talk a lot here about the interplay between society and the ways it gets under our skin to shape the function of our organs, our tissues, and our cells. If public health is about communities coming together to take action that promotes our health, then democracy itself is the foundation of meaningful public health action. And after the presidential debate we all watched on Thursday, it's hard to have a lot of faith in the choices our democracy is offering us right now, and what that means for our future. This isn't a politics podcast, so I'm going to leave the horse race to others that are. But as someone who believes deeply in the vital need for our democracy, we simply should not be forced to choose between one man who is lying to all of us and another who is lying to himself. We shouldn't be held hostage to the ego of a well-meaning, if self-deluded president, lest we find ourselves at the mercy of the ego of a craven would-be autocrat. Which gets us back to our subject today. Because last Thursday wasn't the first time Joe Biden and Donald Trump debated. The first time was four years ago, when we were heading into the worst pandemic in modern history. One that would ultimately take the lives of over a million Americans and indelibly change life for the rest of us. And the fact that we're watching the same two dudes duke it out again, in this case, about golf, in some respects is a reflection of our inability to move past the bizarre world that the pandemic has created. One of the most important features of my childhood as a third culture kid growing up in the U.S. with a summer toehold in my family's homeland of Egypt is that I was given a split screen of sorts, having the opportunity to compare and contrast life in America with life in Egypt. That split screen offers a perspective on what makes America what it is. It's easy to attribute the quality of life that Americans enjoy to the wealth and power this country wields. But there's something more that was always so obvious, something that most Americans, though, take for granted. And that's the quality of our institutions. Whether a little league baseball team, a small business, a trade union, or a Fortune 500 corporation, Americans invest in institutions, in building them, maintaining them, and holding them accountable. And it's nothing new. Back in 1835, de Tocqueville wrote about the Americans' peculiar, quote, spirit of association, which he tied to the democratic ethos he observed here. He said, and I quote, when citizens can associate only in certain cases, they regard associations as a rare and singular process and they hardly think of it. When you allow them to associate freely in everything, they end up seeing in association the universal, and so to speak, unique means that men can use to attain the various ends that they propose. Each new need immediately awakens the idea of association. The art of association then becomes, as I said above, the mother science. Everyone studies it and applies it. That spirit of association has eroded, and the pandemic had a lot to do with it. While the SARS-CoV-2 virus itself infected people's bodies, the pandemic infected our institutions, giving them a form of long COVID that continues to ail them. The symptoms of that institutional long COVID have hobbled everything from our workplaces to our media to, very clearly, our politics. David Wallace Wells is a columnist and staff writer at the New York Times, where he's been writing on the post-pandemic reality in which we find ourselves. I was particularly intrigued by two recent columns he's written on, quote, medical libertarianism and teen mental health. While the two seem unrelated at first... Both speak to the long tail of the pandemic, mistrust in the medical establishment and the isolation and retreat into our virtual worlds, respectively. And I wanted to have him on the show to talk about these topics and the erosion of our institutions in this moment writ large. Here's my conversation with David Wallace Wells. Okay, can you introduce yourself for the tape? Uh, this is David Wallace Wells. I'm a writer for the New York Times and the author of a book about climate change called The Uninhabitable Earth, Life After Warming. I um, really appreciate you, you joining us because there were a couple of pieces that you wrote back in April that uh, I think build to a broader recognition of the post-COVID-19 uh, pandemic era moment in healthcare. It's this moment where, on the one hand, we've got a number of really incredible uh, new developments happening on the side of health tech, whether you're talking about everything that CRISPR is ushering in or you know, GLP-1 agonists that you've written about. And on the other, you have this profound um, sense of frustration with the healthcare establishment, as it were, post-pandemic. And it's created this space where um, you've got, on the one hand, institutions delivering, and on the other, people not trusting institutions. And um, I, I wanted 
really focus there for the primary bit of our conversation. We'll talk a little bit about uh, about about tech and, and teen depression as well. But you 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 coined this term uh, a new age of medical libertarianism, which I just thought was um, really apropos of this moment. Can, can you tell us what that is and what that means to you, and then? Um, Give us some examples of how that works. Well, you know, on the one hand, it's it's actually not all that new, right? Especially conservatives for a long time have been agitating against the sort of iron rule of the FDA and saying that clinical trials took too long and there were all these drugs that people should be able to have access to but weren't allowed to by the American authorities. They were they railed against, um, you know, the, the, the fact that we didn't have... Um, uh, agreements with other bodies in other countries so that if a drug got approved in England, it would automatically be used here. There was a sort of a longstanding libertarian or right-wing critique of the American public health establishment as being too slow moving. And then in the pandemic, there were certain things that illustrated that. And then I also think actually certain things that undermine that critique, but um, the country as a whole, I think came out of the pandemic um, for some reasonable reasons and some unreasonable reasons frustrated with the rule of the American public health establishment, the perspective um, the, uh, uh, of our public health leaders. And, um, you know, as a result, in the aftermath of this, I think we have more and more people wondering whether they should trust um, an organization like the FDA at all, um, and particularly among sort of wealthy self, you know, they're not self-educated in the sense that they didn't go to college themselves, but they, in their professional lives, are also educating themselves about um, lots of new stuff on the internet, um, feeling empowered to sort of decide on their own behalf and even on the, the behalf of the people that follow them online, um, what might be worth experimenting with or what might not be experimenting with. And the piece that I wrote was focused on um, an experimental um, sort of vaccine it was billed as for cavities. Um, and we could talk about the particular details of that um, treatment and reasons it may be good to be skeptical of its, of its promises. But basically, there was a kind of Silicon Valley investor who bought um, a, a, a genetically engineered strain of bacteria that a researcher had developed a generation or two ago and had failed to get through meaningful clinical trials for this purpose bought it, set it up as, um, as a company in, you know, in, a, in um, a, a, a charter city that didn't have any medical oversight in Central America, and then marketed it to his own friends in Silicon Valley as like, this is the cure for cavities. So it had not gone through a successful clinical trial. It had not been approved by, any, um, by the FDA or any other American um, you know, regulatory body. And it was being sold through a kind of a loophole that it was a, a health supplement as opposed to um, uh, a treatment, even though all of the marketing material was like, this will cure you of ever having getting cavities ever again. And um, I saw in the space of just a few weeks, um, this sort of frenetic, um, almost feeding frenzy of excitement among a particular subset of, they call themselves rationalists, um, but community around Silicon Valley who um, take seriously, um, you know, statistical reasoning and are really trying to like outthink the rest of the world. Um, this incredible enthusiasm for this medicine. And then a huge number of them took it. And I just thought, you know, this is, this may not be the most dangerous thing in the world. Like maybe a few of them are going to get diarrhea and that's bad, but it's probably not a catastrophic medical, you know, um, self-sabotage. On the other hand, it's really quite concerning to see so many well-informed, intelligent, well-connected, well-educated, well-networked people who were basically deciding that they weren't going to even wait for any American regulatory agency to weigh in. They were going to take medicine that nobody had tested, nobody had trialed, and just take it on the, on the, you know, on faith. Um, yeah. And that, that's, that was the, that was the prompt for the column, but the, the broader, the broader context, I think, um, as you're highlighting is just as important, which is that in the aftermath of the pandemic, um, even though there are a lot of things we got right, I think to some degree the country is not acknowledging all the many things that we did do well during the pandemic, certainly didn't do a perfect job, but um, the country as a whole has emerged from that experience really, really skeptical, um, really, really um, unwilling to take direction on medical issues from anyone. And even um, in many cases, um, making it illegal for public health authorities to, to give direction. So 
Um, in the aftermath of the pandemic, we've had more than half of American states have passed laws prohibiting state public health authorities from um, offering restrictions in the face of future pandemics. We just had a week or two ago, there's a, a bill going through North Carolina where they're trying to ban mask wearing, not ban mask mandates, which would be its problematic on its own level, but ban mask wearing. So if you are an immunocompromised person and you are still worried about the circulation of COVID or other diseases, and you want to wear a mask when you go into the supermarket, that would be banned. And um, as you know, same sort of news cycle, as we've been thinking about following um, the possibility, the threat of a H5N1 bird flu um, outbreak, you know, there's been a massive outbreak in American dairy car cows, but it's, it's only infected a couple of humans to this point. We're worried it might jump, but it hasn't really jumped into humans yet. Um, the FDA, um, you know, put out a statement saying, you know, you may have heard there's all this milk in American supermarkets that has fragments of this disease, but all pasteurized milk, we can very safely, very confidently say you can drink, um, but don't buy or drink unpasteurized milk. We can't vouch for that and it might be dangerous. And in the wake of that announcement, sales of raw milk, unpasteurized milk spiked. Yeah, we... You know, we've been we've been covering uh, some of this this news, and, and and I think your column gives really excellent context for why that might be happening. And there's there's a layer, a set of layers here, and I kind of want to break them down um, collectively. One of them is the, the 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 choice around what science or how to think about science, right? And you know, science is this process, the interpretation of which is imperfect, but the process itself is what tends to yield uh, the best outcomes. And there is this difference between what science says um, or demonstrates works versus what science demonstrates does not work. And it's interesting because the tech curriculum, right, the implicit curriculum of technology, which is really around engineering, which is about identifying what does work, sometimes doesn't really apply when it comes to medicine because there's rigorous approaches because everything you put in your body has some adverse or can have some adverse consequence. And so we pay a lot more attention to what doesn't work. But what's interesting in the inverse, and like this is the next level, which is the institutions built around science, right? And whether or not you give them credibility to be the correct or uh, the, the um, interpreters uh, on record uh, of what science says does work or doesn't work. And then there's a there's a final piece here, which is around who gets access to those institutions and who doesn't. And, mm -hmm. and, and you raise this um, this really important point about the pandemic and the vaccines, which which to me is just crazy because we develop these vaccines on in a moment where we fundamentally need them to save lives, and they come out in regular time. And so much of so many of the same voices we hear trying to engage in this in this in this in this me medical libertarianism uh poo-poo the outcomes of the the vaccine trials and say we just don't know enough and then these same folks right will brush their teeth with a genetically modified bacteria right to address a problem that is you know and, and dental caries and cavities are a problem but like they're not imminently deadly in the same way that covid was and they're not spreading rapidly they've, they've kind of just spread at the level that they are uh, and we'll introduce this without any actual science. And I guess the frustration that, that folks like me have, take away the institutional hats that I wear, is this is pick and choose, right? This is cherry picking science, totally. which is not science at all. And a lot of these folks do this in the name of what they think of a science, which tends to be this like hacky version, which is like, I can get there faster. I don't need your fancy bells and whistles. Um, and, and I guess my, my, my question to you is, as you've talked to some of these folks, how do they justify that, right? Because if you're cherry picking the outcomes that you want, that's just not science at all. That's just cherry picking information. That's as, as, good, as good as anecdotes to me. Well, I think, you know, the way that I think about how those two things connect is that they're both um, expressions of anti-elitism and skepticism of existing institutions. And they are both expressions of faith that the, the, person, the particular person in question or the community of people of whom he or she is a part um, has superior judgment, um, judgment that's superior to the institutions and regulatory bodies that have um, managed these questions on behalf of the country as a whole for a very long time. And as I said at the outset, you know, or suggested at the outset, it's not as though these people have 
no legitimate complaints with the regulatory bodies that we have. You know, um, there are drugs that have been approved that shouldn't have been approved. There are drugs that probably should have been approved that didn't get approved. Um, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, there was a real bottleneck with testing in part because the FDA was um, was insistent that they approve um, themselves or manufacture themselves. Um, every test that was that was being put out, almost certainly that set us back significantly in those early months. Um, you know, there, there are reasons to think that the, the process for um, producing and, and um, rolling out the vaccines may have been also a little slower than was necessary. You know, it's possible that we could have avoided some of that initial winter surge 2020, 21, um, if we had gotten the vaccines out, say, six weeks earlier, which I think is doable and they've saved, you know, tens of thousands of American lives as a result if we had, if we had moved faster. So it's not as though I want to say the FDA is a perfect institution. I just think those are reasons to reform the bodies that we have rather than say, screw it. I'm going to read a few blog posts online. I'm going to poke around a few academic papers that are not even in my field of expertise or specialty. And I'm going to decide myself what is good and just and safe for me. Yes. But also for like the people um, to whom I'm communicating and advising. And I think that that, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's quite concerning in the case of the cavity, you know, the cavity vaccine, probably not, as you say, deadly, probably not, you know, consequential um, at great scale, but where it points is quite, is quite alarming and worrying. And it does suggest to me, um, you know, that, that there, that we're, we're heading to a place of, of really fundamental distrust and discord in which um, a great many people who should know better are in fact um, turning their back on the wisdom of, um, you know, the wisdom of institutions. And I say that, you know, even as someone who looks back on the pandemic and thinks, as I said a few minutes ago, there are a fair amount of things that we did relatively well there. I, I do think that Operation Warp Speed was kind of a miracle. It saved probably a few million American lives. It probably saved tens of millions of lives um, elsewhere in the world. And though there we have reasons to lament the vaccine rollout, you know, I always think it's important to remind people by the end of 2021, which is to say within the calendar year of the, of the initial rollout of the vaccines, we had 95% of American seniors vaccinated and the vast majority of COVID risk, or at least mortality risk, was concentrated in those seniors. So it would have been nice if we got it to 100%, like a lot of our peer countries. Um, we would have done better. We would have had fewer deaths in the years that followed. But on some basic, you know, like just sit you down in a room and ask you, you know, if someone had sit you, sat you down in a room and said, in, you know, in the, in the spring of 2020, okay, we're going to get vaccines in six months. And like at the end of a year after that, 95% of seniors are going to be vaccinated. You'd be like, that's a pretty good deal. That's a pretty good performance. Yeah. Um, and that's where we ended up. So I don't think that like the, the pandemic itself was like the, the public health disaster that narratively we seem to have um, come to believe that it was. And that's one of the things that really worries me is that as we move forward, not just fringe libertarian types in Silicon Valley, but a lot of good liberals that I know in New York, you know, a lot of good progressives came away from the pandemic really distrusting Anthony Fauci, really distrusting the FDA and the CDC, and really reluctant in the face of even hypothetical scenarios of a future pandemic to do um, as much as we did the last time to protect one another. And that's especially tragic because when I think about this history, I'm like, you know, we, we, there are a lot of things we bungled. There, are a lot of, there was a lot of trauma. There was a lot of death and a lot of unfortunate political disarray um, that came out of the, the pandemic. But I think back on those first three, six months, and I think there was an enormous amount of human compassion exhibited by almost all Americans and indeed almost all people all around the world, um, changing their lives, upending their lives out of concern for their own well-being and their well-being around them. And I want to remember that value that set of those set of values and that behavior, because I want to recreate it in other areas. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. I think the pandemic sort of has made us um, try to forget or pretend that never happened. And yeah. that, among other things, is, is I think, a, a real a real tragic outcome of, of this whole experience. I, I, I agree with you entirely, and I'm not um, going to defend some of the, the big mistakes that were made. But I wonder how much of this is a function of like the memetics of social media culture, right? Where the way you win on social media is to be able to use a mistake made in earnest by a large institution to demonstrate your own clout. And that's how you build. That's how you, uh, you grow on social media. And you, you, you talk about Substackism, like Substack becomes 
um, like the heroes of Twitter, <laughs> like start Substacks. And I, I wonder how much of this do you feel like is just a function of that curriculum that's been taught to us by social media that, you know, rather than trust the institutions that have been out there, you really need to, to, to read this one guy uh, who's been right about one or two things or who did a great job calling out that major institution. Ergo is right about everything. And they've got the true, true, right? Everybody else is just, is just kind of playing to the incentives of the system. Um, how much do you think that plays and in, in what role do you think that has in, in shaping this, you know, th this moment um, as we watch not just, you know, the, the medical establishment and institutions uh, losing credibility, but institutions of all types in media and politics, uh, in, 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 you know, the universities, uh, government, of course. Um, what role do you feel like that has? Yeah, I think, I think it's, that is what's going on. Um, and I think it's useful to break it down into the kind of supply side question, which is to say, why are the people who are um, the faces of these movements, why have they taken the positions they've taken? Why have they become so grotesquely anti-institutionalist as opposed to just critics of the institutions? But there's also the question to ask on the demand side, which is why is it these people, some of them even muzzled in some minor way by social media through the pandemic, I, they've overstated that case, but there was some effort to suppress their, and yet they became out as like, they were the big winners of audience over the course of the pandemic. Um, these are the people who the American public seem to turn to more than um, the establishment voices who are available to them. And, you know, I don't want to say like, it's one side winning or the other. You know, we have we have a lot of information disarray over this period, and there certainly are trustworthy sources who um, built large platforms for themselves too. Right. Um, but it does seem to me, I think, as as you're suggesting as well, that um, over the course of this period, um, we have a, a a remarkable rise of um, contrarianism, um, which is tends to be politically sort of. Um, center right or at least anti left in its um in its perspective um and that seemed as recently as five or six years ago to be an intellectually significant movement but not not a mass movement and over the course of the pandemic it's it somewhat became a mass movement mm. and i think that on both sides of the equation you know you have people responding to that audience and um you know and and trying to serve them with with um with you know messages they think they'll like, but you also have um, an audience that's becoming more and more eager to hear um, that the people who told you what to do those last couple of years um, got it all wrong. And there, I think that there's a psychological phenomenon at play that isn't just about anti-institutionalism. It's not just about the particular criticisms of, of pandemic guidance or public health messaging over the course of COVID. Um, and it's not just about cloud chasing. I think as a country, we are really reluctant to see our experience of the pandemic clearly. Um, we, want, we, we know we suffered, but we don't want to believe that that suffering was appropriate because we don't want to believe that we would have to endure it again hmm. if faced with the same set of challenges. And so we sort of want to pin the blame for the pandemic as a whole on some authority or other who we can in theory fire or replace or some ideology or other, which we can in theory revise or sort of suppress rather than acknowledging that like the reason that we all had a tough 2020, that we were lonely and socially isolated and, um, and anxious and in some, in many cases, caring for very sick people, dying people. The reason that that happened was not because, you know, Tony Fauci cracked his whip and, told everybody that they, if they stepped outside their apartments, they'd get arrested. That actually didn't happen. It's because we were all scared and worried and we behaved that way out of that fear and concern. But now looking back on it, we don't want to acknowledge that we participated in that experience. We don't want to acknowledge that it was a reasonable response to the disease itself. We want to pretend that it was um, not necessary and that the people who suggested that we might do it are ultimately the ones to blame. And I think that there's a, a, very, a complicated but really important psychological dynamic that's playing out now in America, again, not just on the libertarian right, not just on, you know, in, in the Tucker Carlson world, um, but among a lot of people who are, um, who five years ago would have said, like, some, some public health official tells me what to do, I'm going to, I'm going to do yeah. it. And now they think, I'm really not going to listen to those people anymore. We, we just recently had a, <clears throat> a great conversation with a psychologist uh, whose name is Richard Tedeschi, and he talks about this idea as of post-traumatic growth 
And it's fascinating because to talk about post-traumatic anything, you actually have to talk about trauma. And he talks about this way that trauma upends your understanding of the narrative of your life. And what's fascinating is, you know, you're right. And, and uh, Eric Kleinenberg makes this argument that we really haven't dealt with, with 2020 in any real way. And it's like, rather than actually deal with the reality of the lack of agency that we, you know, in 2020, 2024 have over, over nature, right? And the, the ability for a virus you didn't even know existed to upend everything you knew, um, that instead of dealing with that, we, we, we try to find some level of agency by knocking down the very thing we think failed. And what's interesting about this, though, is that I don't think it just starts with 2020. I actually think that one of the reasons there is so much frustration with medical institutions and the medical establishment more generally is the fact that, the, that people have found it lacking in the micro experiences that they've had with it. Right. So, you know, no matter who you are, you're probably paying way too much every two weeks or every month for your health insurance. And then when you need it, now you're hit with a deductible, thousands of dollars uh, to get the thing that you know you need. And then all of a sudden, some public health official says, well, you you need this vaccine. And you're like, well, I'm feeling perfectly fine. And when I needed my insulin or I needed my you name the medication, y'all weren't there for me. Now you want to give me this for free. And I think that there is um, some aspect of the way that the financial incentives of this particular institution has almost set us up for this moment where people say, you know what, I could do it better by myself. And I'm gonna go find that guy who's giving me the, the real, real advice because clearly this isn't working and clearly they're trying to fleece me. One of the biggest predictors of the probability uh, of getting vaccinated early on was whether or not you were insured. And, um, and I think we have to deal yeah. with that and those incentives. And you talk about that a little bit in your uh, piece on, on GLP-1 agonists. And I, I'd love your, your thoughts on, you know, what it looks like to try and win back that trust in the context of economic incentives that have run wild. Well, before I, I say that, I just want to absolutely underline whatever, everything that you just said and, and take it one step further, which is that I think one um, implicit signal that the American public, that the American health system sends every American is that, um, you know, the the services that are available here to all Americans are bad and you need to buy your way up to get really good mm. care. So you're, you're almost, or you're almost invited to be navigating this landscape on your own, trying to find the right specialist, trying to, you know, get your way in if you're, you know, get into some clinical trial or other. And it's like, we are entrepreneurs of our own health. And we are like taught that the basic universal, you know, um, health provisions that are available to most, if not all Americans are not great. And in many ways, they're not great because the other side of it is that we've impoverished a lot of those provisions over the course of decades. We have let so many of the social determinants of health really collapse so that um, we've embraced as a culture, a model of medical treatment, which is like the heroic doctor saving the millionaire from terminal four cancer. And we haven't embraced either at a funding level, at a mythology level, or at an individual experience level, we haven't really supported the things that make the health of everyday Americans better in a systematic way. And I think that almost everyone can see the injustice of that system, but also what it tells us about our own responsibility, how much responsibility we have over our, navigating the system ourselves. And I think that's another thing that's contributing to a lot of these dynamics, um, making us feel like we have to make assessments of our, of our own health and the risks and benefits of a particular treatment on our own, making it seem like we can buy our way to better care rather than just, you know, the best thing you can do is listen to the doctor you have. Um, all of these things are, I think, quite, quite corrosive and to some extent mirrored even in countries that have a more extensive um, health care, um, you know, national health care or something similar, because there's so much of this sort of, you know, so much of the heroism of the individual doctor saving someone's life and much less focus on, um, you know, the securing the basic social determinants of health that we all, we all know are so much more important. Um, in the case of, you know, of obesity and, and the, um, you know, the Ozempic and its, and its cousins, um, you know, I think this is a really interesting moment sociologically um, in the sense that we have had for a long time, as you know well, you know, an incredible um, expanding um, obesity epidemic in the United States. It's one of the main reasons why American health outcomes are so much worse than many of our peer countries. Um, 
we don't even have an especially good handle on what's causing it. You know, when I was first reading about this, there was the, the simple answer was it's sugar, but our sugar consumption has dropped off dramatically and obesity keeps going up. Um, you know, and, and we know that it's making almost every health problem that we have in this country worse. Um, and now we have some drugs that seem to be quite promising um, in treating those, treating that underlying condition much more effective, um, at least in clinical trials than anything that's come before. But they're very expensive. They're basically not yet covered by any major insurance company. And in fact, it's not clear that insurance can cover them um, because they're so expensive. Yeah. Um, there are also other problems, you know, um, people seem reluctant to stay on them for a long time, um, uh, e even to get the benefit that we, th we think they might, they might offer. Um, there are, you know, we're not totally clear about the long-term side effects, so I don't want to sell them as a pure, pure miracle drug. But we have had this, um, this major, major problem, which is a huge part, you know, I'm sure most of your listeners know America's health outcomes are considerably worse than you would expect. Um, based on our, on our wealth and, and spending on healthcare. But just to put a few numbers on that, I've been speaking recently to some researchers who are, you know, just do this very basic math of um, comparing American mortality rates to um, rates across the other wealthy countries in the world and saying how many more Americans are dying in any given year than would if we just had an average mortality rate um, for, uh, for the rich countries in the world. And that number before the pandemic was over 500,000 Americans a year, which means 500,000 Americans were dying every year um, that wouldn't have if we had just had rich world average mortality rates. And now it's up over 2020 and 2021 were, were about a million. But now, even in, in the sort of post-emergency phase of the pandemic, we're up in the 700, 800,000 Americans a year dying that would not have otherwise needed to die if we had had mortality rates to match our peers. And a big part of that is obesity. It's not all of it, but it's, you know, it's one of the major, um, major factors. And we've been living with this. We've been confused by it. We've been unable to really address it medically or behaviorally over the course of 50 years. Um, it just keeps getting worse as a problem. Um, and now along come these drugs and they seem like, you know, more promising than anything we've ever had before to deal with this issue. And yet we are in no position to provide them to the vast majority of people who need them most, which is to say, um, working people, um, you know, the less well off who are nevertheless struggling with, um, with serious obesity. And these are the folks that are hit hardest by the problem. And they're the folks less, least able yeah, absolutely. Uh, to, uh, to, to, to sustainably um, get this medication. And, you know, it's just another one of these, uh, just out of reach moments when it comes to the, the, the healthcare system that I think frustrates so many people and leaves them turning. In these challenging times, organized solidarity is our strongest tool. It's how we understand the threats we face, refine our strategies and craft a unified vision for a future driven by love for our planet and the belief that everyone has a pivotal role to play. That's why Marguerite Casey Foundation is launching a new program, Summer School, Building a People and Planet Centered Future. From June through October, join Marguerite Casey Foundation for an in-person and virtual events designed to help you. Get clear about how we can defeat fascism, plant seeds for a bold, progressive future, and support organizing to win a better world. Featuring movement organizers, partners, and scholars, MCF Summer School will dive into topics like multiracial solidarity, the government we want, and holding powerful forces accountable. Join MCF Summer School today. Visit caseygrants.org slash summer school. That's C-A-S-E-Y-G-R-A-N-T-S dot org slash summer school. Together, let's build a future centered on people and the planet. I want to turn our attention uh, to another issue that you've recently written about, uh, which is uh, the teen mental health crisis. And um, you set up a, a, a really helpful framework that you know folks in epidemiology think through all the time. Is what we're seeing a function of a difference in the way we're measuring or is it a function of something happening in the world? And of course, that thing happening in the world that everybody led uh, largely by a psychologist named Jonathan Haidt um, are, is arguing is, is the advent of, uh, of mobile enabled social media. And I happen to uh, agree with that hypothesis, but you make a pretty compelling argument about, um, about the nation, notion that this might just be what we call ascertainment bias or the, the fact that we're just measuring differently and therefore getting different outcomes that can't be compared uh, to past moments when we were measuring uh, in the previous way. Can you, can you give us the argument on both sides and, and sort of give us a sense of where you fall on it? Well, the, um, the height argument is basically that um, in many parts of the world, um, especially rich countries, especially Anglo-speaking rich countries, 
um, but really across um, the wealthy world, we've seen quite dramatic increases in most measures of um, suffer, emotional suffering and mental distress among teens. Now that's to say primarily depressive episodes, um, anxiety, um, visits to hospitals for self-harm, um, a few other measures. But almost every country you look at, there's been some concerning um, upward trajectory in one of the, these major indicators of well-being. And that coincides, um, according to Haidt and uh, another researcher named Jean Twenge, um, with the arrival of smartphones, and especially they focus on the arrival of the backward facing camera, which enables a kind of selfie culture and, uh, you know, Instagram envy, which they think is the main driver of this problem, especially among teen girls, for whom it seems to be a bigger problem, which is to say, a lot of these trend lines are more are sh growing more sharply among teen girls than among teen boys, and more sharply among teenagers, um, by some measures than 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 grownups. Um, and you know, I think that um, the fact that we are seeing more teenagers report depression and anxiety in a lot of parts of the world is hmm. genuinely concerning. Um, and my question is exactly what does this tell us? Um, and I just have a lot of open questions about this. I don't want to say that, you know, there is no mental health crisis among teenagers around the world. And um, I don't even want to say that there's no relationship to the arrival of the phone. But I think that we've gotten into a, a place as a um, as a kind of a pundit class that, you know, the, the group of people of whom I'm a part um, of just sort of like chalking this up almost like monocausally to the arrival of the phone. And I think that we know from our experience of the world, our, um, you know, our assessments of previous um, episodes of, of, you know, of, of suicide, of, of, of drug use, of, you know, when it, we, we see changes in social behavior, particularly among teens um, over the decades, and we rarely look back on those moments and say, oh, there was a huge spike in teen suicide in the late 80s, early 90s because of this single driving factor. And we don't look back and say, you know, um, the overdose crisis that we're dealing with right now, um, which, which is really quite enormous, um, is is down to a single, uh, you know, single, single cause that there's it's a complicated story. We may want to, you know, um, fault the pharma companies for rolling out Oxycontin. Um, that's totally legitimate. But, you know, th there's there are a lot of things going on that are making so many Americans addicted to drugs and making them um, ultimately die of them, including just the, the arrival of fentanyl and how it's, how it succeeded. Um, uh, other synthetic opioids um, over the last decade. And so when I spoke to researchers who studied this material um, most closely, which is to say how teens are doing all around the world, um, they did not believe what had become completely conventional wisdom among the pundits and among, you know, other parents that I know who are worried about the, the social media use of their teens. And they said, look, all of these global surveys show something about a, a flat trend in teen well-being. Now, it's true that you're seeing some worsening well-being in Northern Europe and the United States, and it's offset by improvements in well-being among teens in, say, South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. And so you could say that there's, you know, there's a, a notable problem here, in, especially in the richest parts of the world. But that in and of itself starts to undermine the idea that we are seeing something that is... Um, so powerfully caused by phones because everybody in the world has smartphones and everybody in the world now has um, social media. That wasn't true five years ago, but it is now, um, or 10 years ago, but it is now. And if we're not seeing these trends everywhere, then um, the, maybe the, the story is a bit more complicated than just that phones are, are driving teens to horrible depression. And the most reliable measure of, um, of well-being that researchers point to is um, not measures of depression or anxiety as registered by physicians or in surveys, but the suicide rate. Um, this is in the same way that crime researchers say, you can't really trust burglary because numbers because sometimes people don't report burglaries. Sometimes the police um, cook the numbers for their own funding reasons. You know, the, the definition of rape has changed over time. So the number of rapes also reflects change, the changing culture of reporting. You know, all these kinds of things, you, you know, um, different crimes are reliable to different degrees, but murder is something that's like, if, some, if there's a dead body, the police are going to pick up on it. They're going to register it. And those are, you know, not perfect, but they're pretty close to perfectly reliable as a measure of violent crime, at least. 
and they say the same about suicide when it comes to mental health that um you know ultimately there may be sub suicidal problems that populations are dealing with but if we're um looking for a, a real distress signal um presumably we would see that it's the best objective metric yeah and in the US american teens are committing suicide more than they were yeah. um a generation ago there's been a, a pretty steady increase over the last decade um it is concerning it is significant but it actually is not any larger than the increase in suicide that we've seen across the population as a whole in the US which is to say there is a bit of a suicide epidemic in this country it is distributed almost equally across demographic groups and teenagers female teenagers male teenagers are not unusual in that respect so they are committing suicide more than they used to but they are not the, the growth is not unusual to teenagers and when you look around the world actually you don't even see that you see almost nowhere else in the world are teenagers committing suicide more than they used to almost everywhere you look they're committing suicide less than they used to and so if we're seeing smartphones driving a real epidemic of 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 crisis of mental uh, really driving a mental health crisis you know in the sense that if anyone picked up a, a cell phone they would be suffering as a result presumably you would be seeing this in the suicide data in Sweden and the Netherlands and the UK and and Italy and in fact those international comparisons are helpful when it comes to the lesser measures too because um while it is um i would say more common than not in the rich countries of the world that we're seeing um a growth in report reporting of depression and and um, anxiety there are plenty of um outliers there too that where that is not the case um in south korea for instance they've um their depression rates among teen girls have fallen in half over the last decade um and what the researchers told me and which seemed completely credible and plausible to me is that um you know a big part of this story is that we have become much more attuned to the well-being to, to questions of mental health and the well-being of teenagers um that's happened at a cultural level which probably all of your listeners can you know they can they, they have experience with in their own lives or the lives of those around them that um people that you know a generation ago might have been ashamed or might not have been so eager to get attention um from a from a um psychiatrist or psychologist a psychologist are now is now are now getting that support um in institutions like schools you have much more proactive efforts to identify um kids who are struggling and and try to get them um some medical help if necessary um and there's also been some sort of institutional yeah. changes along the way so um you know that there was a a change in the when when obamacare was rolled out it actually sort of um recommended for the first time that um primary care physicians screen teenage girls for depression for the first time every year um and that means that almost certainly there were more of those screenings and almost certainly as a result more people were diagnosed with depression than what had been before there were also some changes in the way that hospitals do their coding so that even when people showed up at the hospital um for uh accidents that were probably self harm a suicide attempt um it used to be the case that you would code that by saying you know here's the injury you know there's a there's a cut on their arm or it's a drug overdose or what whatever the the injury was and then secondarily you had the option of saying whether you thought that this was accidental or intentional and many times the people processing that data just left that second column blank and when they changed the coding protocols in 2011 you saw at the national level um literally overnight a doubling in the in the rate of um of self harm um in in hospitals and so for all these reasons i think i come to this question with a fair amount of skepticism i am a phone user i hate my phone I think it's deforming my own life, my own emotional and intellectual life. When I see my daughters playing with my phone, I get really angry. Um when I see my friends looking at their phones rather than talking to one another, that frustrates me too. I think this is obviously and inarguably a major intervention in our social and emotional lives. Yeah. Um I just don't think that the data is really clear for us to say at this point that we know that it's causing a mental health crisis especially among among teenagers and that's not to say i think we should hand a 12 year old every 12 year old a phone and say go spend 8 hours a day in your room um but even that example i think illustrates that what we're really saying is something much more complicated about um social dynamics about um the way we the way we spend our lives who we're spending our lives with what are the trade offs involved in spending an extra hour a day on social media as opposed to playing video games or as opposed to playing basketball or whatever the case may be. I think you know the interesting question is you bring up a number of challenges with actually being able to infer any sort of causation here in large part because you're talking about a ubiquitous intervention. Like we don't have a group of people for whom the iPhone didn't come out. And to me the piece of data that I pay the most attention to right. to your point is is that objective one which is suicide. Yeah. 
But the other problem, I think, when we think about those those national comparisons, you know, thinking having spent some time in the iPhone era in the UK and you know having family uh, abroad in, in places like Egypt, we were a lonelier society to begin with. And I think what happened is the firmament in which this, you know, mind sucking device hit was one where we did not have the resilience as a social culture to be able to uh, push back on it. So I, you know, I think about like, you know, when I travel abroad, I look at people, obviously they all have phones in their pockets, but when you're out at a restaurant or you're out walking, the number of people who are just sitting and looking at their phone versus engaged in a conversation is strikingly different here versus there. And I think you're right, right? It's not a monocausal argument, but it is about the uh, context in which this thing uh, hit us and the degree to which the companies who created the thing and are driving the thing are interested in pushing the thing on us. I mean, we are the most lucrative social media um, uh, market. And because of that, right, the amount of effort to fully saturate us um, is is pretty big. And you talked about your kids, right? Like, to me, like where, where the rubber hits the road is, I, I got two daughters and um, I think about, right, it's like, do what are what are going to be my rules of the road on cell phones? And you know, Sarah, my wife, who's a psychiatrist, and I basically have said that like it's going to be zero phones until you're like 16. And if that means that you're like the not cool kid who doesn't have a cell phone and you're like hankering to look at your other friend's cell phones, fine. But like I am a lot more interested in making sure that whatever the danger may be, I have done my part to protect you from right um, uh, versus being able to engage. When you model that threat, like what do you? worrying about most what is the what's the part of the of phone use that you're so that you're most concerned about i think there are there are three pieces of it one is the fomo that comes from comparing yourself and your life to other people when you know we all know that instagram is a literally a high, highlight reel of other people's lives and so when you're bored out of your mind sitting in your house an envy machine yeah, yeah and you're just like oh their lives are great and i'm bored or it's comparing yourself and how you look to someone else, right? Get that perfect hair or that perfect skin. And all of us know our imperfections, right? And we all know that uh, an Instagram reel can be airbrushed. And then part of it is also like the, the, the way that it, it – I, mean, I don't think – you know, you, you go back to um, theorist Postman. And our minds aren't created to be able to handle all the worst news all the time. And – you know, I think about the way that I'm consuming the Gaza conflict, for example, right? And the suffering of children who look like my children in Gaza. And that is awful. And I I think it's really critical in the sense that we all know what's happening. And for the first time, you're seeing very clearly the imagery coming out. But I also think that it is having a profound impact on my mental health and the mental health of so many other people around me because we are not good at being able to leverage or change our engagement with something relative to our uh, agency. And so that failure of saying, I'm literally watching children be slaughtered in my face and I can do nothing about it day in and day out, I think creates a space that um, that is very difficult to occupy. And social media does that to us all the time, right? I mean, this is a particular unique example of it. But, you know, I think about all of us who consumed the post-Trump news, right, all day and all night of like all the things we wanted to stop from happening and couldn't. Um, and so, you know, it's those two things that I think are the, the, the most profound. But to your point, like to the point that we were talking about, maybe the most important thing I or you or any of us can do to protect our kids from the potential danger, whatever it may be of it, is to build a compelling social environment for them to grow up in. Right. Like I think about, you know, one of the most important things we do is like try and eat dinner together every night. Right. And I, I work really hard to get home for dinner because I want them to have that experience of, you know, talking about issues in a safe space and being able to know that they're loved and engaged with. And so those rituals that say real human contact is so important and valuable and you should fight for it in your life. Right. I actually think it's probably the antidote. Right. Because I want my kids, frankly, more than anything else to look at a phone and be like, ah, this sucks. It's boring. Let me go. Let me go like find somebody and actually engage with them in real life. And I think that's the place of control where most of us forget. It's like, yeah, take the phone away. Fine. But if you don't have something that's compelling and the, the phone is the most compelling thing, then that's where people are going to find themselves. And I actually think the challenge for us is that we have created a society where there is nothing that really competes. And, you know, and then, and then people fall into their phones and then fall into all these traps and then don't have an alternative to be able to go to.
Yeah, I mean, I think the the way that you talked about your experiences ab- abroad are, is really, really, you know, hits home for me. This is, it feels like, um, as it was with the pandemic, we saw America responding in, you know, to a new threat in ways that revealed many of the underlying issues that you and I might have identified before and still, nevertheless, shocked us as we lived through it. And um, I think it's remarkable how um, atomized, how lonely um, Americans feel um, and how difficult it is for us to um, fi- ha- have access to real, um, real human community that can be sustaining in the face of, you know, emotional challenges, um, social challenges, but also um, at more, you know, more difficult times of our life, health challenges. And um, it's just, it's, it feels in many ways like a, um, yeah, we're, we're a very, we're a country that's very vulnerable to, to many of these challenges. And it probably shouldn't surprise us that if there were something trigger, being triggered by, um, by social media use and phones, um, we see it most dramatically in the U.S. in the same way that it shouldn't surprise us that among the rich countries of the world, um, our COVID outcomes were so poor. Yeah, no, I really appreciate, um, I really appreciate those points and you know, grateful to you for, for plumbing them both in your writing and in your book and then also uh, here with us. Uh, our guest today was David Wallace-Wells. You can read him uh, in the New York Times. Um, and uh, we're just really appreciative of um, your time, David, uh, and look forward to uh, hopefully having you on again soon. Cool. Sounds great. We'd love to. Thanks for talking and uh, see you soon. And that's it for today. Thank you so much to David Wallace-Wells for joining us. If you have guest recommendations for the show, share them with us at info at incisionmedia.com. If you love our show, make sure to like this and please subscribe for more content like this. And if you want me in your headphones, America Dissected is also a podcast. You can subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget to follow me at Abdul Al Sayed on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. And to check out more of our content and subscribe to our newsletter, head on over to incisionmedia.co. Links to our sponsors are available in the show notes. Please do check them out and show them some love. They make the show possible every week. 